Thank you very much. Now, Bonnie. Good morning, everyone. Wulis um, Bazwiro, that's how we say it in uh, Penobscot language. It's really good to be here today. Um, as Lauren mentioned, I am a member of, um, or a citizen of Penobscot Nation, and we're a small tribe indigenous to Maine. Um, I'm a member of the Fisher Clan, and I was nominated to serve on this committee uh, by my tribal chief and council, and I just want to take this opportunity to acknowledge them publicly. I'm deeply appreciative of their confidence uh, in my abilities to carry out this work, and I'm also deeply honored to have been selected to serve. I'd like to start with a story, and I share this because it helps to put my approach to repatriation into perspective. When I was a, a young student attending the University of Maine, I took part in my first repatriation event. And this was in the early years of NAGPRA, and through the good work of some dedicated individuals, um, our tribe was able to arrange for repatriation of several ancestors from regional institutions. And one day, uh, I was approached by one of our elders and invited to help prepare for the reburial ceremony. And I welcomed the opportunity and agreed to help. And my role in this was to take notices door to door to community members and let them know when and where uh, the reburial ceremony would take place. Now, I will admit, at the time, I was hoping for a task that was a little less mundane, but after a couple of decades reflecting uh, on that experience, what I've come to realize is that um, it was a very wise thing for that elder to have me do because by going door to door and talking to people, most of whom were not active in repatriation, I was exposed to the power of repatriation in inspiring hope in our communities because when the repatriation process works, people see that the wrongs of the past can be reconciled. And that's a very powerful thing. And I believe as Indian people, our hope and our strength are intertwined and we need both to survive. So in a nutshell, I do this work um, because it helps to heal our communities. So with that, I'd like to turn to the work of the Repatriation Review Committee, of which I'm chair. I've been on the committee since uh, 2011 and was appointed uh, as chair last year. And what I plan to do today is to pro provide you with um, some background information on our committee, our charge, our membership, uh, our responsibilities. And then I'll touch on, uh, on some of the rewards and challenges um, to serving on this committee. So by way of background, uh, the Re Smithsonian's Repatriation Review Committee was established by Congress in 1990 under the NMAI Act. It was initially charged with monitoring and reviewing the inventory, identification, and return of human remains and funerary objects. Originally, the, 19, um, the uh, 1989 NMAI Act did not address this position of sacred objects and objects of cultural patrimony. But this changed in 1996 when the act was amended. And at that time, the committee's responsibility expanded to include those additional categories um, of material culture. The committee is advisory to the Smithsonian and our responsibilities are very similar to those of the NAGPRA Review Committee. And as outlined in the act, and you have, have it there, we have uh, four primary functions. Uh, the first is with respect to the inventory and identification process. We work to ensure uh, fair and objective consideration and assessment of all uh, relevant evidence. We also, upon requests of an affected party or otherwise, review any findings relating to the origin or the return of human remains and cultural objects. We facilitate the res uh, resolution of any dispute that may arise between Indian tribes with respect to return of human remains or objects. And then we have a catch-all function, which is uh, to kind of perform any other related functions the, as the Secretary of the Smithsonian uh, may assign. So um, originally, the committee consisted of five members, which the Smithsonian selected from nominations from around the country. In putting together this uh, original committee, the Smithsonian sent out over 1,500 letters uh, to Native American tribes and organizations, and uh, 62 nominations were submitted. The first group of committee members served for 15 years and made considerable contributions in the development of repatriation policies and procedures at the Smithsonian. One notable action taken early on by this committee was to earmark funds for travel grants 
to support tribes with uh, repatriation activities. And this grant su uh, provides support for tribal members to travel to uh, the Smithsonian to help facilitate the repatriation process. The committee has continued to administer financial support for these activities, and over the years, this has been an important component um, in not only carrying out our repatriation mandate, but it also serves to foster positive relationships between the museum and tribal communities. And to date, 157 tribes have received travel grants to support repatriation efforts at the Smithsonian, and this amounts to roughly uh, $480,000 in uh, total funds awarded to tribes over the last 25 years. Today, the committee uh, consists of seven members. Uh, four members are drawn from nominations by Indian tribes and Native American organizations, and currently those members include myself, Walt Lara of the Yurok tribe, Darlene Miller of the Seneca Nation, Dr. Ian Thompson of uh, the Choctaw Nation. And three members are selected from nominations made by museums and scientific organizations. And these current members are Dr. Uh, Shelby Tisdale of the Autry Center in Los Angeles, uh, Dr. Jane Bikstra, a professor of bioarchaeology at Arizona State. And Jane will be terming off in December, and we will be looking to uh, fill her position. Um, and Dr. Timothy Pertula, who's manager of archaeological environmental consultants out of Austin, Texas. Two of our members must be uh, traditional Indian religious leaders, and this ca category of membership was added in 1996 uh, when the amendments to the act occurred. So in carrying out our responsibilities, we work very closely with the repatriation office at uh, the Natural History Museum, and currently the staff uh, includes uh, seven individuals, there's a program manager who's responsible for uh, program operations. We have four case officers who work directly with, um, who work directly on uh, repatriation claims through uh, tribal consultation, researching uh, cases and documenting uh, cultural affiliation evidence. And there are two support staff. We have a museum specialist who's assigned to the osteology laboratory and a coordinator uh, for our committee. And I will say that uh, this group is um, a group of top-notch individuals who care deeply about uh, repatriation and their work with the communities. The committee meets at least two times a year, and uh, once a year, a committee member will conduct what's called monitoring visits. Um, we take these opportunities to review the work of the staff, meet with uh, the director of natural history, um, and we also meet with the Chair of Anthropology Department. We discuss uh, any issues or concerns that may uh, come up throughout the year, and uh, we conduct some general committee business at that time. As a committee, we sometimes use our advisory role uh, to effect change at the Smithsonian, and one recent example of this occurred within the realm of uh, repatriation office staffing. Because repatriation work was originally perceived as finite or having uh, an end point, which we all hope it will, um, some of the case officer positions at the museum were term positions or temporary, and Jonathan was very helpful in this. Um, our committee viewed that situation as problematic because case officers would start working with tribes on a case and be faced with their em employment period coming to an end. We viewed this as very disruptive, not only to the repatriation process, but also to the relationships that were developed uh, between the Smithsonian staff and tribal community members. As a committee, we were able to advocate for that change, and now the staffing in the repatriation office has more stability. And although it may seem like a small change, uh, we believe it will improve the overall efficiency of the repatriation office. Throughout the year, uh, we also review and comment on all case reports that are generated through repatriation claims. And it's during this process that we examine evidence um, used to determine cultural affiliation. Uh, we also review the methods and criteria used uh, to determine uh, that cultural affiliation. And uh, we examine the qualifications of and methods and criteria uh, used by any outside experts who were consulted on the case. Currently, our committee is in the process of establishing a more structured work plan. We're in the very early 
stages of establishing some goals and priorities for what we would like to see happen at the Smithsonian with respect to repatriation over the next few years. And part of this work um, is identifying what we as a committee can do to help the repatriation office accomplish their mission. As far as uh, challenges go, uh, it's been my experience um, that the challenges we face as a committee um, are far outnumbered um, by the positive aspects of our work. However, challenges do exist, and of course, some of those challenges center on things like um, uncertainties in federal funding, uh, maintaining adequate uh, staffing levels, and the enormity of the workload at the museum. But what I view as a real uh, challenge is our advisory status. And here, I'll venture more uh, into my own personal views and not necessarily the committee's. But I think it's important to point out that our committee does not have decision-making authority when it comes to repatriation decisions. And those decisions rest solely with the institution. And it can be very frustrating as a committee member to work within a system in which um, you have limited power over the process, but you do have influence. In my opinion, this is reflective of um, a larger problem relative to uh, repatriation in this country. And while the laws acknowledge the rights of Indian people and provide a process for uh, tribes to assume care and responsibility of their cultural heritage, at the end of the day, it's the institutional leadership that holds the power and decision-making authority over the collections. Um, it would seem to me that a more equitable uh, process would incorporate a more balanced approach to decision making. And while uh, challenges do exist, it's important to recognize that there are many positive aspects to serving on this committee. And um, for me, the rewards are associated, um, well, they fall into uh, two primary arenas. First of all, I truly value the opportunity to be part of a process that reconnects people with their relatives and to their homelands. To date, 6,007 individuals have been culturally affiliated through the work of the repatriation office and have been made available for repatriation. While a lot of work remains to be done, it's a significant accomplishment and one that should not go unrecognized. Second, much of what I've seen during my time on the committee is a sincere effort by the staff to work towards developing good relationships with tribes. Efforts such as creating a ceremonial space for tribal people observe, and observing tribal protocols around the handling of material culture represent good practices in tribal engagement. I think the staff works very hard to serve tribal people well and it's very rewarding for me to see what can be achieved at an institution um, if they acknowledge their role in, re in improving relationships between tribes uh, and museums. And I will admit that disputes and disagreements have and will continue to occur, but by and large the tribal voice is more prominent within the museum um, than it was 25 years ago. And I'm confident that that trend uh, will continue as we move forward uh, through the next couple of decades. Our committee is dedicated to the repatriation process, um, and as a young woman delivering those flyers two decades ago, I never imagined I would be serving tribal and museum communities in this way. It's not always easy work, and there are some days where I'd welcome the opportunity to simply go door to door and talk with people about repatriation. But needless to say, I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity to help facilitate uh, the repatriation process at the museum. And again, I, I think it's because it's, it's a really important part um, of the healing process for our tribal communities. In closing, I just want to take this opportunity to put in a plug and encourage tribes to reach out to the staff at the repatri repatriation office to learn more about the collections and the repatriation process, particularly if you have never interacted with the office before. Tribal claims are an important part of the process and the staffing and our committee encourages tribal members to visit the museum and consult with them about the collections. And uh, for more information, uh, the website is anthropology.si.edu. Uh, I encourage you to um, reach out to them. I want to thank you all for the opportunity to speak here today and I look forward to seeing what can be accomplished in the next 25 years.
Thank you uh, so much. We've got about three minutes left, so I just want to follow up, actually ask you, Bonnie, the same question I asked Jonathan, to get your perspective on the question of, of how much weight and respect you feel that the Smithsonian gives to the review committee. And I, I realize this relates to your comment about yeah. whether the review committee should be more than advisory, um, but generally, how, what, what is your observation? Well, it's been my experience that um, they're generally very good. And I, I think that we uh, work well with the committee, but I do think there's some work to be done. I think we need to um, uh, have more of a dialogue about um, our, our role as a committee, because what I fear is that committee members um, may not feel that their work is meaningful. And if that happens, then you know, we'll have challenges keeping good people. Um, so I, I believe that um, we, need to, we need to work on that a bit, I think. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry that we're not going to have time to take questions from the audience, and I'm sure all of you are ready for, for lunch. I guess I just want to say, in closing, I want to thank each of the panelists immensely for their very thoughtful comments. Uh, we've come a very long way from those early days that Suzanne described this morning, and especially since the uh, enactment of the NMAI Act in 1989. And we owe a great deal of gratitude to everyone who's been involved, from the legislators to the legislative staff, museum staff, board members, advisory members, the NAGPRA staff who, who've been helpful to us over the years as well, and, and of course, perhaps first and foremost to the tribes who have, have entered this process with us and we've, we really have achieved so many successes in these past 25 years. So I just want to say thanks to everybody here and beyond and um, I hope you'll join me in, in a big round of excuse me, applause for our panelists.